So welcome to season two, episode one. I uh, don't know why I jumped to season two, but I felt like I needed some way to categorize like a quarter long run, right? Uh So I figured that was a good way. So we'll do uh, 12 weeks in a season. I asked a newer user, but somebody who's imminently qualified, I think. I mean, geez. Uh, but you, you're gonna have to help me pronounce your name, Joaquim. How, how do I say your name, bro? Um, it's in Swedish. It's uh, Joaquim, but Joaquim, uh, Joaquim is, is also <laughs> acceptable. I want to say your name the way that you want it said. Um, you know, my partner calls me Joe, so you know, I'm I'm happy with Joe as well, which is there easy. You. <laughs> so. All right, Joe. You're Joe now. Um, I can't butcher that. I can try though. Um, so, Joe, uh, how did you find out about Numerai? Well, I think it was, um, I can't remember to be honest, but I think it was through uh, Quantopian, because um, I was, I've been an active, you know, user on Quantopian for um, a couple of years now, and um, um, I think it was through a, a forum post there, um, or I just kind of looked up uh, what are the, some of the competitors to Quantopian, like on Wikipedia or something. Um, and um, yeah, I found um, uh, Numerai, and it just looked really difficult. So I didn't, didn't start yeah, right away. So I just kind of started um, a couple of well, a couple of months ago now. Um, mm-hmm. um, and I think you know, early on, I wanted to um, you know build my own um, kind of stock market predictive um, strategy. So Quantopen is kind of better for that. Um, but now I'm looking to learn, you know, machine learning and, and data science. And, and uh, so I think Numerai is just perfect for that. So, well, yeah. can you, can you talk to me a bit about how Quantopian prepared you for Numerai or Numerai perhaps enhanced your skill set for Quantopian? Because while they're yeah. related, they're completely, totally different. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I had to, first of all, learn Python in order to to yeah. use either Quantopian or, or Numerai, I, I think. Yeah. I mean, you could use other programming languages with, with Numerai, but uh, um, Python is the one for, for data science, I think, in, in general. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had to learn Python, and, and uh, Num- uh, Quantopian has a number of really good uh, uh, lessons and, and uh, tutorials on, on their side, but I also took number of um, you know online courses on um, udemy and, and uh, course uh, coursera and uh, uh, data camp i think and, and also youtube videos in general um so i had to learn python and, and you know if i hadn't learned python on, on quantopian I, I wouldn't be able to you know participate in, in numerai either so um and you know numerai helps me um understand data science techniques uh, such as you know machine learning and, and you know um, validation sets and, and you know test sets and, and, and you know not overfitting essentially mm-hmm. uh, and that helps really me with the quantopia strategies as well so they kind of um, benefit from each other I think. yeah uh, I think they're complements for sure um, when I I think I've I've mentioned before, but I'll say it again. When I started coding, I was looking for domain specific applications of Python and I found Quantopian and it was, it was, to me, it was a perfect fit. But then I realized that I don't really know how to code. And some of the, at the time, this is, yeah, four years ago. At the time, I didn't know enough Python, core Python to even get started. Uh, I would just find like an example script or something and hack it, but it was awful and I quit. But in the Quantopian forum, similar to you, somebody mentioned Numerai, and that's what brought me over. Um, I went all in on Numerai because of the machine learning aspect. Uh, I thought that was the wave of the future. That, that was a pretty good thing for me to do because that's worked out quite well. And now I've learned the Python, and I don't have time to try Quantopian. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I can't be a baller like you and be highly successful in, in both. But, uh, you know... I think it's pretty dope. You're regarded as one of the top users on Quantopian. Have you always been near the top or did you kind of learn as you go? <laughs> I've learned, I mean, I consider myself a, a newbie for a long time on, on Quantopian, um, probably at least six months. 
Um, but um, yeah, and I definitely consider myself a newbie here. Um, you are. It's okay. And, uh, but, yeah, that's okay. You know, like um, we're all beginners yeah. at the start, right? So yeah, um, I learn something new every week. So I guess maybe I'm still a newbie. Yeah, <laughs> and I can ask all the stupid questions too. You know, so without I don't believe in stupid questions. So. <laughs> But yeah, um, I um, and it's it's um, I'm not I'm not really sure when when I consider myself a more of a experienced user on on Quad Token, but the, at least six months I think because it, it took me about three months to develop like a, a strategy to that I, I thought was recent recent or um, reasonably good, um, but. Um, yeah, so at least six months, and I reckon it'll be at least six months here before I uh, consider myself a, not a, a newbie anymore. Uh, we'll see. Um, you may yeah. still be a newbie <laughs> after four years like me. I, I don't know. Um, it, I don't think it matters as long as you have fun and are learning something and making money on your yeah. stakes. That I think is the, the ultimate litmus, te litmus test. Yeah. Um, I can kind of tell from your accent and the fact that you're drinking coffee in the morning that you're somewhere on the opposite side of the globe of me. But uh, where where do you live these days? Um, we live in uh, Brisbane, Australia. Um, I'm Swedish originally, but I haven't actually lived in Sweden since '94, um, so I'm quite old as well, <laughs> above average in age in, in this group, I, I think. Um, but um, I um, I went to school in the states and then I, I um, worked for a long time in, in Tokyo, Japan, uh, and then in Sydney after that. Um, but now, yeah, we live in uh, Brisbane, Australia. Very nice, very nice. Um, I don't know what I can ask you about your Quantopian stuff, but like I said, you're like one of their top users. How how did you get there, and what makes you one of their top users? I'm trying to ask you a question without really asking something direct and giving things away. Uh, yeah, um, just kind of participating in their contests, I think, and, and you know the challenges lately that they've they've been having and having success there. Um, I think one key lesson is for me is is learning not to overfit because it's so easy to <laughs> overfit. Basically, um, you can run you know five hundred back tests, you know, right. and I think your average sharp is you know. Your 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 top average sharp uh, sharp is going to be um, um, two or three, I think. You know, so you then you can just take that one, but that doesn't mean you're going to get uh, you know a sharp of two uh, on live data, right? So um, yeah, just kind of learning not to overfit. I think was uh, a key, uh, something that I, I um, uh, it took a while to learn, but uh, uh, helped me to. Uh, become, I guess, one of the, the top users. Awesome. Um, what do you do for a living? Are you kind of like full-time quant gig work genius? That's or? what I'm trying to do, yeah, to be honest. I liked the keynote's ask, answer to this uh, question last uh, last week. I uh, try not to work as well. Uh, I um, uh, My career has been in finance. and You know, I studied finance in, in school, but uh, um, when uh, we just had a, um, um, our son born uh, about three years ago, so I quit my corporate job at that time and trying to venture out as a kind of freelance uh, quant and, uh, or data scientist. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I'm uh, trying to achieve now. And uh, I'm having mixed successes, I think. But uh, um, yeah, it would be nice to be able to live off, uh, you know, Numerai and, and, uh, as well. But uh, at this point, I, it uh, doesn't seem to be too realistic for me anyway. Uh, but uh, no, I, th yeah. I think that it will. I think we'll get there, right? Mm. Um, that would be cool. I think we'll get there. It has a lot of things have to go right. Mostly, Richard needs to raise a lot more money so that the AUM <laughs> goes up, 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 well above the filing thresholds so that we can all bask in the glory of the meta model, right? But uh, I know that for sure that is on the roadmap for everybody involved. Hanson's not in his head. NJ's all in, yes, see? So we can do it. Every time I peek my head like this is because I can't see the person under my camera. And I just, uh, I have to see, I'm a visual person. Anyway, <laughs> so I, 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 I digress. Um, you use Python, you just told us that. Have you dabbled in R yeah. at all? 
a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's almost <laughs> only. I yeah, it's, it's like kind of like a waste of time once you've pretty much dove in on something. And if you already have pipelines mm -hmm. such as you do with Quantopian, then yeah, that doesn't yeah. make a whole lot of sense. So you're a new user, but I bet you still have three tips for the tournament. Um, yeah, I think the, the tips that have already been mentioned are probably the best ones, but I can mention a few things, maybe. Um, um, I think one key thing for me is to um, divide up the data, you know, um, uh, in, a, in a good way, you know, between train, validation, and test. Um, so you can, you know, develop a good model and, you know, on, on the validation test uh, uh, set and, and uh, and then test it on the test set. Uh, so, you know, on on my uh, forum post, I think I described how I'm trying to do it, but um, well, there are other ways as well. But, but uh, I think that's that's one lesson to to have a validation set that's representative of of, um, of your training set. I think is important. Um, number two, maybe. Just something simple, you know, um, combining models, you know, <laughs> if you have uh, a number of uh, different models that are each predictable, but, um, you know, different from each other and you're just averaging them uh, might be a good idea. I mean, there are other ways of combining, but. Uh, uh, that's definitely the, probably the easiest way to combine models. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. basically. <laughs> no, that's uh, super robust. By the way, I tell my students to do that. And okay. one of my students is ranked 15 overall in the leaderboard and rank 11 on the staked. Wow. It's a really powerful yeah. method. So, yeah. And then number three, maybe um, I think, you know, once I'm done with the model um, and I'm happy with it, that it's, I've tested it on the test set, you know, it's held up. Um, then instead of going live with it as is, then you might as well, or I think at least that you might as well train on, on all the data that you have. Um, and they go live with that. Uh, I guess the drawback with that is that you no longer have a, a test performance uh, um, or, or test performance to compare live performance with. But uh, um, yeah, I don't really see that as, a, as too much of an issue. But um, I, I do the yeah. same. But I th I, you probably heard me. You may have taken that idea from me, and that that's good. Fit it on your limited sample. Make sure the parameters are set right. It gives you the best out of sample. Yeah. Once you have yeah. that, lock the parameters in, then fit it on the rest of the training data. And yeah. you can include validation if you so choose. Yeah, so cool. I'm glad that's working out. Was, I'm sorry, though. Was that two tips or three? Did you get to three? Uh, having good, to, you know, d yeah, division between uh, train, validation, and test, uh, combining models, and uh, training on all the data. Okay, yeah, so there it is. Um, so. That's awesome. There's a really, really important question. We had a tie in the last season as for who the favorite team member was. We can't have a tie in this new quarter. So I think we should start out with your vote for your favorite team member. Uh, I'm going to have to go with the, I think someone hasn't chosen um, this person yet. Um, I, um, yeah, I tossed up between two people, but, but uh, uh, I'm gonna have to go with with yeah, <laughs> Jason just because uh, he's Jason. <laughs> yes, Jason. Thanks. Feels good. Yes, the unsung hero of compute, the new coming yeah. hero of Erasure Quant. Yes, and I can't tell you how helpful he is. I have yeah. pestered him countless times, and he's always been patient and kind with me, and I appreciate him greatly. So yes, Jason. And he always seems to be able to figure out what's, what I'm doing wrong as well. <laughs> I think he may have access to all of our computers and all of our code. Because it is a little eerie just how yeah. much he knows about what I'm trying to do. Yeah, it's a little wild. Um, so you have, okay, so I asked you that. What is your number one feature request or your request for an improvement related to the tournament? Yeah. Um... I think um, I don't really have a feature request, but uh, I think the one that I have a complaint. <laughs> sure. If, if that works, <laughs> it's not really a complaint, but I think that the, what I struggle with the most is um, um, 
I'd like to be able to stake more, but I also don't want to, I'm too afraid to buy Numerai because I don't know if it's going to drop by 90% tomorrow or, or, or double, you know? Um, so I think doing something about volatility of, you know, the token that we're staking with, if that's, I don't know what the solution is, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just pointing out the problem. Uh, what I, what is the problem for me? Um, but I think that's, if something can be done with that, that would be my, my number one request, I think. No, I, th I think that's totally valid. That's something I've talked about with the team a lot. Um, and it's also about as difficult a question as this being the most difficult data science tournament in the world, right? Yeah. Um, so solving that volatility question is is extremely complex. And I, yeah. I haven't really figured out a mechanism for that. Um, people have tried. I think OFS has a OF underscore S has a pretty decent proposal related to uh, an option strategy. But again, it's it's complex, but it is sound from a empirical and quantitative perspective through the finance lens that I look at. Um, so, so yeah. Well, thank you for taking my questions, Joe, and thanks for your attendance as well. You. You're always on, yeah, and we appreciate thank, you. Thank you, for, thank you for having me on. It's um, these are great. Before I get to Slido, I actually came up with something over my little break here. Uh, well, I already showed you Ant's good news related to the birth of his child, the week old in his arms now. So that was going to be how I opened this next piece. But let me just close that out. So one of the things that we're all a little uh, kind of upset about was the memory usage, right? So let me share my screen real quick. What I wanted to look at was how do I get the, the, the data types to kind of be fixed? One of the ways that I can do that is download the data, right? Capture the features in a list and then kind of string it all together and force the D type on the read CSV function, right? Because if I tell pandas that I want the D type for each column, I specify that in advance, that's how it loads it. So that makes it a little more memory efficient. If I store that dictionary as a job loop file, then I don't have to do this first step every time. So in order to even create this dictionary in a somewhat efficient way, I've got to download the data, capture the feature list, and then create this script to come up with this dtype dictionary, right? And then I, I dump it as a job loop file. And we can do that. It doesn't take long, right? So I just finished and the job loop is done. So the next step, right? We can use the traditional way, such as what we have here. Let's take a look at how much information is being used. And we gotta let those download a second. But what I noticed was having this fixed on AWS is really convenient because we don't have to use Numerox, we don't have to hand download anything. We can just take the straight CSV files. It's really convenient. And thankfully, I'm on a pretty decent download speed. Let's see how long this takes. Hopefully not too long. But what I do is after this all loads, you can see the memory usage. I'll then run it on the dictionary. And then we'll take a look at how the memory usage goes on. But what I want to propose today is that we use the feather file format. The benevolent dictator for life of pandas is a developer of this project. Wes, oh gosh, was it McKinney? Yeah, I think it's Wes. Uh, at any rate, Feather is directly compatible with Python and R, and it stores the D-type directly in memory and, and makes life pretty easy. So here, our download's finished. We have a memory users with 1.2 gigabytes for the training data, 3.7 gigabytes, of RAM for the tournament, right? If we run that again, this time we capture the, the data type and fix it, you'll see the memory usage goes down significantly. But then if we save those files as feather format, it gets compressed and it's a direct RAM plug with data type 32 or float 32 for all of the numerical columns and objects for the strings. And what you'll see is that by storing it in this way, we'll let that run. But I wanted to show here the feather file format 
it stores arrow tables or data frames. And it uses the arrow IPC format internally, right? But it's language agnostic data frame storage for Python and R. That I think is the most important takeaway. This format captures the majority of the users of the tournament. And since it's completely language agnostic, we don't have to fuss around too much with the code to import it. I thought that was extremely important. I need to move something real quick. So let's see how long we, okay, so here we go, right? So now we have the D-type stored. The training data takes 606, 607 megabytes, and the tournament file is 1.8. I've saved them. I used the feather package. I've saved them, training compressed, tournament compressed, and I use LZ4 compression, okay? Now, if we were to come back into the environment and say, oh, well, you know, I want to use this data, well, let's do that. It's, it's loaded, it's the same, right? But I didn't have to import any special modules. It works directly plugged in with Pandas, right? And you'll see it's the same. So we have 606.8, 606.8, float 32, float 32. It's direct, it's good to go. The tournament file, same thing, right? There is no memory overload when you use this file format. Language agnostic, big fan. So that's what I wanted to present today. I think this is a, a way that we can move directly into the optimizing of memory usage. And now I'd like to talk about it. What do y'all think? Well, uh, has the memory user changed or is it reduced by any measure? It's reduced specifically to using float32. So it's equivalent if you were to create that dictionary that I did on the CSV mm -hmm. load. So you could use the, the D-type dictionary, and it will load the file the same way. Or hmm. you can convert it to a feather format, and then you can pass it to R. You can download it directly into Pandas with no a special import or extra steps. It's just instead of read underscore CSV, it's read underscore feather. Uh, from what it, I remember, Pandas also supports uh, Parquet files. But yes. Somebody speaking. I'll let them speak first. No, it was Joe. But go ahead. You're on. You're doing fine, Jeremy. Yeah. Come down. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So that's one thing. So you might want to benchmark uh, Parquet. And the other thing is, uh, there's but possibly is, is a way parquet, to do this with. Is Parquet language agnostic? Well, I've used it with Scala and Python, so I'm fairly sure there must be a reader for R as well. I'm because in, in usually in uh, industrial settings, Parquet is quite widely used uh, with Spark. And uh, I mean, if it's very similar, as in uh, Arrow interoperates pretty well with uh, uh, Parquet as well. Another thing I was thinking of was, I mean, if you really care about memory usage, maybe it might make sense to uh, have no memory usage rather than low memory usage. Here, here goes JRB right? again. I mean, he's going right. to drop something on us and we're all going to be like, oh my no, God. It's, it's actually, it, it's an ancient <laughs> concept called, you know, you, you can essentially memory map a file. Yes. Right? So what you can do is you could save your NumPy array to disk with uh, NumPy.save or SaveZ or one of those things. And then in loading it, you can essentially pass a flag saying use mmap. So that essentially means that uh, your file is memory mapped, which essentially means that it actually it's actually not using physical memory. It's using the page cache, uh, which your operating system provides. And uh, since you're reading it sequentially anyways, uh, I think you, you will probably end up uh, thrashing a lot of memory if you uh, shuffle your data, but I, I don't think most people do that. So th that might be something worth uh, looking at. Well, if it's as easy as this, and I can just do df equals pd.read underscore feather, and I can do that in your format, then it's a, it's a drop in. I think the key well, is that all you have to do is uh, you have to get uh, df.values and say numpy.save right. uh, of df.values. Well, in this and case, I have a whole pandas data frame saved. And so if people are using pandas. Yeah, I think this is a lot more uh, flexible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree. So that's the, that's the takeaway here is that I'm balancing, uh, I'm balancing the number of users who are impacted, the workflow that the tournament already uses because it requires you to get the rank, which is a pandas function, not a numpy function. So anybody who's tried to come up with the correlation score that's posted and didn't have it working with pandas already will not be able to replicate the rank, right? Oh, 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 that is super easy to do with NumPy. 
Well, that's fine, but it takes more code uh -huh. and it's not plug in, right? So what oh, I'm trying it, to do it takes is just as much code. The most possible uh -huh. users, easy peasy. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make it more complex, good on you. But I think this is like a, a fantastic starting mm -hmm. point. But Joe, you wanted to say something. Fair enough. I just, um, I think the reason why it's so fast is because it stores um, the data in a similar way that it's stored in memory. It's is exactly the same, yes. Okay, yeah. So. It, it is the actual RAM, I don't know, I'm not, not a computer scientist, but my understanding is that it's like the way it's stored in RAM is then stored as the feather format. And so it reads it in, in milliseconds rather than seconds. So the loading mm -hmm. is significantly faster, but it doesn't have the memory overload problem that N Numerox uses, right? Because it reads it in at full precision and then converts it back to float 32. That this completely skips that step. It reads it directly in in the format that it was saved, and so that I think is a pretty powerful uh, way of doing it. But one thing I'm glad Anson's here because this is something that I didn't know and I wanted to find out. Uh, when we use the Amazon Web Service direct links to download the CSV file, they're really, really, really highly compressed, and I don't think the Feather file format can be compressed like that. So Anson, is it a problem? from like uh, paying AWS to have us download all these things perspective? I don't think so. I mean, S3, the amount of money we pay for S3 is, is very small in the okay, grand scheme. I, you know, I, I didn't know if like a six fold increase in file size was a problem or not. Yeah, uh, I it mean, is a bit of a problem. I mean, we did, we, okay. <laughs> we did high compression. So I, I should be answering this because I'm the one that did all this, all the tests sure. on this. I, I chose a high compression because in my testing, what always dominated the time of reading the CSV file was downloading from S3. That mm -hmm. was the largest component of reading. Um, so pretty much at any, any other change, it, it, it was all beaten out by just decreasing the file size as much as we possibly can. Interesting. Um, except that the CSV file loads at full precision. Yes. So right. not, we're not talking about memory. We're talking about a... Uh, uh, the only thing I was optimizing for when I was optimizing this was read times, calling read CSV. Yeah, and that's fine. My What I'm trying to overcome is the complaint that the data uses too much memory. And it does, and everybody says convert float32. That's like the first thing you should do. And so why even bother converting it? Let's just download it straight as yes, float32. And this way, they don't even have to download a special package. If the team provided us the feather files, either as an option of available file formats, then it's plug and play. And it's plug and play for R and Python. When I realized that this would work that way, I was super, super excited. And so I said, you know what, I'm gonna do it live. I'm gonna talk about it live and see what people think. <laughs> um, so yeah, if it's not a cost concern, that's good because I didn't know anything about that. I don't know what that looks like. I think I'm open to, um, you, you know, delivering the tournament data in multiple formats. Um, it shouldn't be too hard for us just to like generate it in every single format that, you know, you guys would want. Um, but just order of operations, I guess it's maybe we can collect some more ideas and feature requests for, you know, what our data API should be. So I'm in the process of collecting them. There's a couple that I've heard, which I think are pretty good. Maybe uh, be able to download different eras separately you know, be able to download, um, you know, validation one, validation two, like separately. So I think we're, we can make some improvements there. File formats, um, cutting up, cutting it up differently. But yeah, later, not now though, not now. I, yeah, I really like the, um, I mean, one thing that always has bothered me for a long time is that the example scripts, example, uh, what's it called? Example script.py or whatever that you get in the Numeri data sets um, doesn't read from the, from the website. So it has like a file path and all this stuff. And I, this, this should just be like a much better way to, to have, because most, if users, if most new users download this data and build off this script, they might not realize that there's a couple of small changes they could have made to the data to make everything run twice as fast. And uh, that is, demotivating. So I want to make that example script way better. Uh, if you want arbitrage, what you just showed uh, might be something we should just put into uh, the GitHub uh, repository 
where these scripts live so they can be improved. But yeah, I know there are a lot of different ideas, but um, something has to change. These scripts aren't good anymore. They're like outdated. So let's take some questions. I have a question from Anonymous. Is it possible? Well, this is like one of those things that I'm just going to read it. I'm just going to read it. Is it possible to create an external service to make, to make possible to stake with leverage on Numeri? Leverage up to 4x. Uh, I don't think that is something the team can work on, but like if you build a DAP or some kind of like way to loan NMR and you can figure that out, well, I think that would have to be independent of the tournament. But let's just check. Let's ask the team. Is that is it possible for, for you guys to implement a way for us to create extra leverage on our predictions? Well, the you can like I mean how how you can how you leverage anything or how, how you hedge anything is by selling exposure to the same thing. Um, and if you, for example, had a big stake on Numeri. Uh, of $100,000 worth of NMR. Uh, then you went to a place that you could borrow NMR uh, with collateral. So you put up half a million dollars of DAI in some collateral bank. Um, then you could borrow another $100,000 of NMR against that. Your first $100,000 already staked and the $100,000 you borrow, you can then sell on the market. Um, so now you don't really have NMR exposure, but you do have an NMR stake. Um, the problem with these things is that the risks are kind of in other places. So this would all make a lot of sense if DAI were in fact extremely safe, that you, wouldn't, that you would be prepared to put half a million dollars into it, but maybe it isn't safe enough or that the contracts power, powering these things had perfect security and were perfectly safe um, and couldn't be hacked. So for now, I do think the risk of taking on the volatility and just staking as much as you want to with that volatility is probably better. Um, but loaning uh, and other leverage and things would work in a similar way uh, where you would put up this collateral, borrow a lot of NMR, against it and then stake more than your means. Um, so I think all these things will happen and there's many companies doing these things. I think some of them do them for NMR. It's just a question of, well, how much liquidity is there really? How much do you really trust it? Right. I would think it's worth kind of like ignoring this whole thing for like a, another year and then looking at it again um, because the markets will become better and denser and there'll be more proof that this works. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So th that's the answer then. I think we pretty well solved it. It is the, the Mellon protocol. Is that is that the one you can get loans of NMR from? That was, uh, that I was don't like know. a year and a half ago, right? Is it yeah, Mellon or Dharma? Dharma used to do stuff like this, but I'm not even sure that's their main thing anymore. Um, and then there are other ones, Compound and DYDX and things. I, I don't actually know uh, which ones are, but I remember them like tweeting, oh, we've listed NMR. You can now right. borrow NMR but I never really tried to do it. Yeah, there's so many things going on in crypto. I can't keep up with it all. I just try to stay in my lane, so to speak. And so like the the DeFi movement, I really am far behind on. It should be more front of mind for me as, as I'm claiming FinTech as a specialty. I always thought that somebody could create a hedge fund and this was probably experimented with too soon, but you could create a hedge fund that owned a lot of numerator. The sole purpose was to fund successful data scientists at a high level, right? And if you thought that they were consistently good and they somehow participated in locking up the model, then the hedge fund could add to the stake and make money that way. But uh, I seem to remember some of the early, early, early first day sales of tokens went to a group that was going to try that and that didn't quite work out. But again, I think it was just too soon in the, in the whole ecosystem to try it. Uh, why are Michael Oliver's account still on the board? Is this not a conflict of interest? So it's an alignment of interest. An alignment of interests. <laughs> an um, alignment of interests. Yes, that, that makes sense. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit. So, like, um, we still need uh, 
to think about it more but like ultimately if there's a prize that uh if money if if there's a prize like the reputation bonus uh where it was like only the top 50 get this and if you're position 51 you're not you're out of this and if there's anything like if there's a tool if there's something like that then it's bad for us to have some of our own models there right. um for example like integration test could was even taking up a space on the leaderboard and maybe your real position is wherever you are minus how many integration tests are above you and stuff um but if there are no prizes uh if there are no rewards like that um then I don't see the harm in uh, having people stake um, inter in internal models from Numerai uh, be there staking. Some of them will give the code for, some of them will be experimental ones that we're trying. Uh, when we made Michael P join, uh, we like, well, you know, you have to take your stake off or whatever because we had that reputation problem, but now we don't. So we kind of want Michael Oliver to keep staking keep having the experience of being a user right um so you know we can still uh, do that um so i kind of like it but i think what we want to do maybe is make it way more clear so like integration test on the leaderboard should almost be like grayed out um and be like this is a numeri model and then even michael oliver's ones be like grayed out mm -hmm. um so that you really know uh, there's uh, the, what they are um, because there are a couple of models like I've mentioned there's a model called Sugaku uh, mm -hmm. which is actually you know one of Ralph's models that he tried did, did well now it's not doing as well as it used to be um, and that was using era boosting kind of stuff um, so but it should have just been clear from the beginning that that was also a numerai model I don't know if he was staking but even if he was I don't see I it as being a problem yeah, Bohr, you bring up something that I can close this whole section on. When I was in San Francisco about a year ago, this came up because I want to help expand the user base, but I want to stay a tournament participant. Richard, you told me, you said, I want you to stake, and I don't want you to not stake because I want you to stay close to the users, right? And so I have. I can tell you beyond reasonable doubt that there is no advantage to having insight to the data. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen the data. I don't want to see the data uh, because it will only bias the way I use the data, right? And so even though they can peek at the data, I don't think it will help them. I think it will hurt them. And you just heard Richard say that, that uh, Ralph's model was built using error boosting Ralph had insight into the data and he still couldn't beat integration test, right? So even with this tremendous amount of insight that we all don't have, it didn't help, okay? And in order to help people participate in the tournament, you kind of need to participate in the tournament. And so I completely agree that if it affects rank, then yeah, that's like kind of not fair because you can still peek at the data. You do have some insight that could be advantageous. And so that, I think that's exactly the right move. But in order for team members to help, internal team members to be able to help, they really do need to work with the data. They need to experience the tournament how we do. And so that's something that I've tried to hold close to heart this entire time that I've been helping with example scripts, teaching the data to students, developing training modules and things like that, is that I am a tournament user and sometimes my model sucks. <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm always good. So I'm in the trenches too. And so, yeah, I think it's not a conflict of interest when there's no reputation bonus involved, such that, you know, the, the models affect the rank of others. And you should want the team to participate in the tournament in that way, because then they can help us better. What will replace the reputation bonus come in September? Should burn insurance be tied to reputation? Well, I don't know. I'm going to have to pass to the team because I don't have insight into what's being worked on. Well, yeah, I mean, MMC replaced reputation is kind of how we see it. Um, I think specifically the bonus. I think the key word in that one is the bonus. Yeah. 
but you could have a model that um, does very well, like something similar to example predictions, and then a MMC model that does very well in burn periods. And you are now rewarded for having such a model because of MMC. Um, so I think we don't have ideas beyond that right now. It's not like out of the question, but uh, any, as we said before, anything that's kind of free money is going to be badly uh, botted yeah. or st basically stolen. Um, yeah. And uh, we don't, we want it to be that it has to be as hard as the, t the stock market itself. Anytime you earn money should be because you had an edge over the market, not because we made some rule that made it easy to make money. Good MMC models, do they tend to um, do well in burn periods? And the second question is, what's kind of the ratio between earn and, and burn periods? That's burn? a very good question, Joe. Um, empirically, I did a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work on the difference between burn and earn periods. Uh, over the life of the tournament, it's you're more likely to burn than to earn by a small margin. But we're talking about small margins to be profitable. Okay. However, in Kazutsugi, you're far more likely to earn than you are to burn. And so it might be more relevant to look only at the performance during Kazutsugi. And so, like I said, over the whole tournament, you're more likely to burn. But that has not been the case with this new data set. And what was the first part of that? And I kind of went on a tangent in my brain a lot. Um, if MMC models tend oh. to do well in burn periods. Oh. So MMC, the calculation of MMC changed relatively frequent, uh, relatively recently. And so I don't know that we have enough information to say that. We've also not had a burn period in uh, 13, 14 weeks now, which is unheard of. Even in the tournament, like the life of the tournament, we would get a burn after a 10 week earn run. Like it was almost guaranteed. You, could, you, you couldn't help it, it was gonna happen. This, all my expectations and all my priors have been blown out of the water with the Kazutsugi data set. And so I don't think we have enough data to talk about MMC in terms of how it does in burns because we just haven't had any. Uh, I'm anxiously awaiting a burn period because I want to see how some of my models will perform. So it's, it's odd for me to wish to see some burn go on, but. Yeah. I think the, um, the validation data, uh, now that we've increased it, if you sort of train a model and you see, you can see how many burn errors there were or how many burn eras in a row. And that's like your drawdown if you're having it. Right. Um, you know, that's representative of the test set. Uh, but the first, the previous one, the previous 12 months of validation data were not representative of the test set. You tend to do way better there. Um, and the idea of having a 0 0.04 correlation uh, isn't, isn't right on the test set, a lot of people were more like 0 0.02. Um, and so the new validation is representative of that. So yeah, if the, in the validation too, it's quite hard to make a model that has like four burn months in a row, um, but it's also quite hard to make a model that has no burns over the validation. Um, so that's a good way to think about it, something like, 75% of the time or 80% of the time not burning um, would be what I hope it works out to. But that has not been historically true as Arbitrage says with, uh, with previous data sets where it felt like you wouldn't burn that much, you felt like you had a good model, then you would burn a lot. But now we have enough data and a better target that it's harder for that to happen. Thank you. Uh, the reason I'm asking is you know, I'm just trying to figure out like what the proportion of, of MMC versus core, you know, currently I have half of my models on, on core and, and uh, half on MMC and, and staked equally. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out what, what's the best yeah. way to hedge my bets. Well, you might want to look at the, co the, the coincidence of them failing at the same time mm. uh, on the validation data, because if the, if the one does have meta model contribution, it's scored by first neutralizing the portfolio, uh, the, 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 prob the predictions to that. So if you do have MMC, it's because you have an edge when others don't, which is typically when um, 
models fail. So when you run an MMC model that has 0.5 correlation, I think those, a lot of those will tend to do quite well. Um, I saw Sorios, one of our biggest stakers, he switched to MMC on Sorios, but not on his other accounts or what I think are his other accounts like Dalios and other ones. Um, and that seemed like about right to me because he's also got about half the money on MMC and half not. Um, so I think, uh, but obviously MMC, we have a kind of leverage on it. So if you're wrong about having it yeah. and burn badly, um, like I think it's a really bad idea to stake MMC on something that's very similar to example predictions, but worse. I mean, then you're really not going to be in good in a good way during a burn period. No, that's a good question. And I would just go back to my point that we haven't really had a burn period in the new MMC era or iteration of the tournament. And so patience, I think, is is called for here and a little more time collecting data on how we all perform. I, I think a lot of people change models just for MMC. And if that's true and we start sticking on it, it's going to completely change everybody's stuff, even if you make no changes yourself. So like I, I mentioned a week or two ago that my correlation with the meta model is declining as the stake amount is increasing, right? Because I'm kind of keeping my personal stake amount the same, fixed at a, as close as I can to 400 while everybody else is growing, right? So I'm peeling my profit off, but everybody else is compounding it in. And so my correlation with the meta model is shrinking a bit. And so I'm noticing MMC is starting to behave a little differently. And so like those really small things are occurring to everybody. And so we probably just need to wait a little bit. And how long is a little bit? Your guess is as good as mine. In, in past iterations of the tournament, like when they've announced a data change, I, start, I would start staking as heavily as I could and as fast as I could because people would be hesitant to stake and I could make more money that way. That doesn't seem to work in this iteration. Rudy's shaking his head. You probably did the same thing, didn't you? Yeah, buddy. Yeah, those are the good old days. <laughs> Get in before anybody else figured it out. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. uh, I mean, if, you've, if you've been around for a while, you've seen these changes happen. You know exactly what other people are going to do. Because I did it at the beginning. I was yep. also hesitant at the beginning. So, so yeah. Yep. So I don't know if that's going to work out for MMC. I, I was hesitant for MMC. I didn't do it. So uh, we'll see. All those things just, just go to say, like, be really careful. Take your time. It's okay to wait. We know how correlation works, so stick with that. Track your performance over time and make a decision that works best for your risk tolerance. When, roughly, did the Numeri fund start trading in the live market with real capital? The first day. On, yeah. Oh, just in general, right? Like, is it two years ago or? or um... Oh, yeah. It was uh, December 2015. Okay. But... It was the, at that time, that was the very first day. So we were using uh, my model a lot. Um, and then we also weren't really well set up for like um, trading globally. Uh, so subsequently we set up with UBS to have proper prime broker um, and be able to make all these trades in different markets. Um, so things kind of started to get more real like two years ago. Um, and then uh, when we started Kazutsugi, things got particularly uh, real because that was when we felt like we were at the stage where we really liked the fund um, as a, yeah. And then the first two months weren't that good. Um, but it, yeah, then, it was weird. Know. Kazutsugi opened with serious major burns of, I was like, oh no, what's going on? <laughs> Anonymous is asking, what does the reputation column on Numer Dash stand for? Is it a new scoring metric? Yeah. Uh, no, um, I just took it off uh, because I just took it out because it's it was the old reputation one. Okay. And uh, and, and yeah, and uh, by the way, I'll be working on the next two weeks in in sort of like allowing people to compare their models, at least on the basic you know reputation and MNC score. But you know, let's give me some time, two weeks more or less. Anonymous is asking, for new participants, is it better to focus on MMC or correlation? MMC seems to be 
future and the most useful for Numeri, right? So let me take that first part. Um, when you're first starting out, MMC is a little strange to think about. I would recommend somebody new, maybe not a astrophysicist level of usage to start with correlation uh, because it's more intuitive. You can directly measure it and you don't have to worry about the effects of other people impacting your MMC. I would say do that. Collect data on your candidate model before you flip it to MMC. Or then once you have a good candidate model, build something that's different from it and target MMC. Personally, I think your first model should be correlation. But the second part of the question, MMC seems to be the future and the most useful for numeri, right? Yes. Yes, because they want diverse opinions that are weakly good so that they can build the meta model to be strong. Uh, but to jump straight in and target MMC, I'm just not sure you're going to get the traction that you might want to then stick around and see how you do. Uh, anybody else want to comment on that? I think that's right. Okay. Um, Richard agrees. Yeah. Rudy was shaking his head. He was agreeing along. Okay. Yeah, I got the head nod from Ike. He agrees. Very cool. Michael Oliver's nodding along. All right. So I guess I got it. Cool. Thanks for joining, everybody. Uh, we'll try to get the summary out soonish. And have a great week. See you in Rocket Chat. Thanks. See you guys.